we need to know the answers because uh, this community uh, needs to find out lots of things about uh, things that went on, how the, the whole crisis was handled. Residents of High River, Alberta are going to have to wait a little bit longer for the answers they want on the flooding, the door kicking, the gun grab. Uh, the report into this by the RCMP Public Complaints Commission has been delayed yet again to the end of October. Edmonton Sun columnist Lauren Gunter joins us now. Uh, Lauren, this is, this is depressing news, but the good news is we're getting more information even before we find out about the report, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And we've learned a couple of new things. I mean, you and I have been watching this very closely now for over a year. And, and so we get little bits and pieces here and there. We got two of those little bits this week from uh, an independent firearms researcher in Alberta, a guy named Dennis Young, who's been following this like a hawk. He's, he's filed uh, a whole bunch of access to information requests. And by taking the answers that the RCMP gave uh, last week to MP Scott Reed's order paper questions, he, Scott Reed had asked this whole series of questions about who authorized this, you know, what orders were you taking, under what authority were you operating. He, he got a whole bunch of, re of responses from the RCMP, and Dennis Young has matched those up to things that the RCMP has previously said. And yeah. he's found that there are a couple of things in the order paper answers that were given to, to MP Reed uh, that don't jive with what the RCMP had earlier said. All right, so I want to show one of those. A uh, question on the order paper from Scott Reed. What are the names, ranks, positions, units, and detachments of the RCMP officers who authorized or otherwise initiated the removal of legally stored firearms from residences? And the Mounties responded with, no one authorized or initiated the removal of legally stored firearms from residences in High River. But an ATIP uh, from July 2013 showed that, yes, they confirmed that in some cases, firearms with trigger locks were seized. So. Absolutely. That's a legally stored firearm. They were still taking them. Absolutely. And it's, I, I think that the problem here is that the Mounties are still operating under the 1995 rules that came out when Alan Rock and the Liberals first brought in Bill C-68. And that was you had to have each firearm trigger locked. You had to have it locked then in a locker. And the locker with your guns had to be in a separate room from the locked locker with your ammunition. I mean, it was this, this idea that somehow a shotgun shell was going to jump out of its case slide into the chamber of a, of a shotgun and blow somebody up. So they had these ridiculous laws. Over time, judges have said, this is completely unreasonable. You can't and they, do And they've this. struck it down. Right, you, Absolutely. So, you, and so what they got... basically said, that legal storage is trigger lock in a closet. And that's where the Mounties were finding guns, and they were seizing them anyway. All right. You've got questions about the RCMP saying that they, uh, number of people they, they rescued, because they searched 4,600 mm. buildings, including more than 3,000 private homes, but they say that they rescued 38 people. But you note that they've got notes on rescuing 143 <laughs> yeah. pets, but there's no notes detailing the rescue of a single person. Uh, yeah. To me, we, that we, says maybe they didn't 30. rescue anyone. Exactly, and they've changed their wording too, from rescue to uh, assisted in leaving town. So uh, it makes it sound like they were giving the bums rush to people who were refusing to adhere to the, the evacuation order. Now, there are 300 and, almost 330 people who stayed. Their part of High River wasn't affected. The lights were on. The sewers were running. The water was still going. The gas was still on. And so they stayed. And the Mounties, in, in report after report after report, that you can just see they're grinding their teeth that these people had the audacity to stay in their homes when they, the Mounties, had told them to leave. And so it's not, you know, I start to think you got 143 pages about how they, they saved Fluffy, Fluffy and Fido and fed them and watered them and kept them at the detachment, and no pages on these alleged 38 rescues. I don't say they didn't rescue 38, but it's, it's kind of suspicious after a while when you have all this documentation about pets, but somehow the pages dealing with these well, rescues of 38 humans don't they rate don't exist. coming out in, an ac ac you know, in access to information. It's just... It's, it's a little perplexing. Also suspicious that uh, we are uh, delayed yet again, but we'll have to talk about yeah. that another time. Uh, not looking good, Lauren, but we'll talk about it another no. time. No, it All doesn't. Right. I'm a little pessimistic. Thanks, Lauren. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Now, a quick note on something that we'll be following up on tomorrow. Justin Trudeau talking about what we started the show on, and that is ISIS and what Canada's response should be. Here's what he said to a question earlier today.
I think Canadians have been uh, very clear that uh, we're not interested in a combat role uh, in Iraq. The Liberal Party is not supportive of any extension into a combat role. We think Canada's role uh, should be strictly non-combat. All right, in case you missed it in the question, Trudeau also ruling out Canada helping with airstrikes. He doesn't want boots on the ground, I get that, but saying no to airstrikes, he just wants to hug people? More on that tomorrow. Email me your thoughts on everything we're talking about, byline at sunmedia.ca. More to come.